من هون نعلن افتتاح هذا المؤتمر والجلسة الأولى ننتقل إلى المايندز تشابتر مع الحلقة الحوارية الأولى تحت عنوان الذكرى المئوية للحرب العالمية الأولى 2018 نحن هل نتجه إلى نظام عالمي جديد؟ ندعو إلى المنصة كل من السادة فيليب كرولي the former United States Assistant Secretary of the State for Public Affairs Professor Steve Heidman, Janet Wright Catchman, Professor of Middle East Studies, Smith College, and non-resident senior fellow, Center of Middle East Studies, the Brookings Institution. Rana Mitter, Director of the Insti University China Center at the University of Oxford, Professor of the History and Politics of Modern China. And I can not be with me today for my own And I also ask Dr. Abdelaziz Sakhir, Founder and Chairman of Gulf Research Center. بدير هالجلسة الأستاذ سام نسا Executive Director Maison du Futur صباح الخير أنا كنت معتقد إنه في سوبرمان واحد بلبنان بين إنه في جراندايزر وسوبر وومن تاني هي ما شدية فا ما بعرف إيش مطلوب مني أحكي بالإنجليزي مع انه الباقيين كلهم حكوا بالعربي لا لا حمشي بالانجليزي لحد ما و I will start with short intro and we'll go question and answers first with the panelist and then we'll leave the last 10 minutes of the session to the audience uh, allow me first to convey my thanks to the conference organizers, starting by my dear friend May, as well as to welcome our prominent panelists. On November 11, 18, the armistice ending World War I was declared, ushering the beginning of a new world order that saw later on the waning of three totalitarian ideologies. Fascism, Nazism, and Communism, and the ascendance of liberal democracy. On November 11, 2018, the leaders of the nations that once murdered one another gathered in Paris to mark the Armistice Centenary. This event saw the light of day amid a rise of populism in Europe that challenges democracy and threatens the very existence of the European Union. A U.S. reverting to isolationism with its president's America First slogan. A scene which just like a century ago prompts us to wonder whether a new world order is unfolding, statism, nativism, identity, and nationalism are in the midst of a comeback. They have emerged at their strongest after a quarter century of being pushed to the margins by globalization and its attendant forces. In November 16, 2016, when it became clear that Donald Trump was going to be the next president of the United States, Florian Philippot, chief strategist of France's far-right Front National tweeted, their world is collapsing. Ours is being built. Who are they whose world is collapsing? Is the American era coming to an end as the Western-oriented world order is replaced by one increasingly dominated by the East? Is the liberal democracy waning. Really, many questions without answers till now. With the climate change, cybersecurity, and all its manifestations, artificial intelligence, the questions of whether we are merely heading toward a new world order or toward a new world seems legitimate. 
We will try during this session, we have one hour, I think, to discuss these questions with our distinguished panelists. Philip Crowley, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs and professor at George Washington University. We have Stephen Heidman, Janet Wright Ketchman, professor of Middle East Studies. Uh, and he is with the Center for Middle East Studies uh, at the Brookings Institution also. And also we have uh, our friend, Mr. Abdelaziz Saqqar, expert on Gulf politics and strategic issues, founder and chairman of the Gulf Research Center. Uh, I will start with uh, Mr. Crowley. Mr. Crowley, what do you think is remaining of the world order of the 20th century? Uh, Sam, thank you. But before I, before I answer your question, Stephen, I want to take a selfie. <laughs> we, we can't talk about free connected minds without a selfie. <laughs> um, I'm a product of the Cold War. I don't think that we are confronting a new world order. Um, in the Cold War, there were two competing systems. Capitalism prevailed. Communism gave up. But we are seeing a renegotiation of rights and privileges within the existing international order. And particularly among populations around the world, we are seeing a challenge to the assumptions of uh, an interconnected, uh, of the benefits of an interconnected and interdependent world. Um, and I'm, I'm sure our colleagues later in the day uh, will talk about the digital space in particular and recognize that this growing interconnectedness brings uh, both potential benefits but also uh, risks as well. Uh, I myself am dealing with the challenges of interconnectedness. Uh, I am here in Beirut. My luggage remains in Casablanca. Oh well. Um, but I, I, I do think that, you know, if you look at, at several examples, in, in the case of the United States, um, the American people and, and the President of the United States are challenging, you know, the benefits and costs of the United States playing the role, if you will, of system administrator of the existing international order. And, and so there was a retrenchment that has started under Barack Obama and has certainly continued under uh, Donald Trump. He talks about America first. He doesn't mind if you want to talk about Lebanon first. Uh, but his is a world of, of walls and bands. Uh, I, I, I certainly agree with you know, Minister Riachi that we should be talking about bridges, not talking about walls. Um, and, and so there's a, there's a question in the United States about, about both playing the role of leading system administrator and also the costs that go along with that. In the case of countries like China and Russia, um, they are questioning, uh, you know, China has become the major defender of the existing international order with the retrenchment of the United States. Um, Russia is challenging and perhaps undermining American leadership within the existing international order. Both of those countries are, are trying to create uh, spheres of influence in their own backyard. You know, China, for example, with the South China Sea. Russia, for example, with its incursion uh, in uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, most recently uh, in Syria. Um, among the people uh, in the world, they are challenging this interconnectedness as well. Um, you know, for example, in Great Britain, you had a, with a referendum in 2016, a instant reordering of British foreign policy. Uh, and so there, uh, but, but you know, the, as, as Britain voted for Brexit, but even as Britain tries to create even arm's length uh, space between it, Britain and the European Union, for example, we're finding in the negotiation of actually how to do that, disconnecting yourself from these institutions that are still pushing us closer together, is actually very, very hard. Um, but certainly, um, the people are wondering about you know, globalization 
uh, and I was in the Clinton White House when we thought that globalization was going to uh, bring uh, significant prosperity to countries of the world, and, and, for, and significantly that has happened. Um, at the same time, we probably underestimated the costs involved in that. You know, we've seen the increasing disparity of the haves and the, the have met, have a lot, and have a little around the world. Um, and, and even here in the Middle East, you see an example of where there's an impulse towards greater connections, but then you have governments that are trying to protect the status quo at the same time. So you, you have tension in terms of how to um, you know, um, manage inside the international order, but you don't have uh, the creation of a competing international order. Uh, Stephen, uh, to what extent do you think, and within the same question, the United States is responsible about what is happening now in the world? And starting yeah. with Obama mandate and now with Trump. I'm talking about the last, let's say, 10 or 12 years. I, I think that's a terrific question, Sam. Thank you. But first, my thanks to Dr. May, to the Meshidash Foundation, uh, and to all of those who had a role in organizing this, this wonderful meeting. I gather it's the seventh year this meeting has been held. That's not a small accomplishment, so congratulations. Um, I'd like to follow up a bit on, on some of the ideas that PJ introduced, because I, I do think that there is a significant shift in the global order that's underway, even if we don't know yet where that shift will end up. But what's also very clear, and this, Sam, I, get, I think gets to your, your question about uh, some of the impacts, more direct impacts of that transformation, of, of that shift. It's very clear that this, ex that, that this transformation is not being experienced in the same way in every world region and that the impact of this shift in the global order is being felt with particular force in this region. And I would explain that as a result of this region being at the epicenter of three very distinct elements of the transformation in the global order that's underway. One at the international level, one at the regional level, and one at the domestic level within states in the region. These transformations are all connected. They play off of one another. They contribute to uh, an environment in which they influence and amplify one another, but they're distinctive. And I think it's worth teasing them out for a moment so that we understand what some of these distinctive drivers of change are that are reshaping the global order. A at the international level, as PJ, PJ suggested, we are seeing a continuing shift away from a post-Cold War international order in which the U.S. occupied an exceptionally powerful position. That is being felt in this region in particular by the growing disengagement of the United States as a critical manager and, and interlocutor in regional affairs. But it's also being uh, manifest in a downgrading of the extent to which American officials perceive the Middle East as an area of strategic importance and an upgrading of the extent to which other, regional, uh, other international actors like Russia and China perceive of this region as an area of critical strategic importance. It is increasingly difficult in Washington to make the argument that what happens here in the Middle East is a matter of critical importance for U.S. security interests. Now, what we're also seeing is that the process of managing U.S. disengagement, of managing this transition, has been a very messy one. It has not been handled smoothly. And I think we see the effects of that in elements of regional turmoil and instability that have been manifest here over the past decade. I do think that these changes will have effects that will bear directly on U.S. national security. But as I said, that is an increasingly difficult argument to make in Washington. The second transformation is a regional one. It consists of an ongoing struggle to define the regional security architecture 
that will manage relations among regional actors over the coming decades. We're seeing that struggle play out in part through conflicts in Syria and Yemen that can be described to some extent as proxy wars, not entirely, but in part. But the defining element of this struggle is that neither of the key protagonists, neither Saudi Arabia nor Iran, have yet arrived at a willingness to think about the kind of security architecture that would respond to the core security concerns of one another at the regional level. And as long as that conflict is taking a zero sum rather than a positive sum form, I think we will see it as an ongoing driver of turmoil and violence in the region. The third transformation is happening at the domestic level. It's a shift in the way the authoritarian regimes across the region are thinking about the challenges of domestic governance following the uprisings of 2011. One of the options available to those governments was to move in directions that were more inclusive and participatory. The formation of what the World Bank calls new social contracts. Instead, these governments have chosen to move in the opposite direction toward the organization of governance frameworks that are more exclusionary, more repressive, that do not address the core social and economic grievances that sparked the protests of 2011. And so we have conditions at the domestic level that are also volatile and unstable in a very troubling way. All three of these shifts are happening at the same time. And as I said, they're interconnected. They play off of one another. But they create an environment in which this move toward a new global order, a move which is incomplete, which is not linear, we do not know its destination, but in which this movement is being experienced here in this region with acute effects. And I think this poses dramatic, significant challenges for those with responsibility for governance in this region. And I have to say, I don't envy you. I don't envy you because I find it difficult to think about pathways out of the current context that will produce a Middle East region which is better governed, more prosperous, more stable, more secure, and offers the people of the Middle East more opportunities for economic and social mobility. And so the real challenges that we confront are, are quite broad, uh, very demanding. And I would hope that one of the things that we could use to draw the U.S. back into the region would be the possibility that it could play a constructive instead of a counterproductive role in working with regional partners to try to address these three transformations in the region. And I will go back to you after Mr. Saar about uh, the role of the United States in the region. Thank you so much. Again, uh, Mr. Saqar, uh, do you think you know, within this period of, let's say, transformation or changing, uh, changing atmosphere or climate, I'm talking politics, uh, there is kind of a renewal of despotism in the region. We are heading towards to renew the despotism in the region and especially after the what so called the Arab Spring, and now we are going back to renew like regime in Syria, in Egypt, maybe in Iraq also. What do you think? Well, first, let me thank Dr. Maishad Yaq for the kind invitation. It gave me a great pleasure to be in Beirut again, the lovely city. Uh, you have done a great job, and you gave your life for your freedom. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be with my good friend here, the distinguished uh, panelists with us. And thanks, Sam. It's been a long time since we have uh, been together. Maybe I'll start uh, the beginning of the last century. It was a struggle between the Ottoman Empire and the British Empire, where the British gave a lot of promises, but no delivery, unfortunately. They promised an Arab state, and then we end up not having it. They uh, promised the uh, Belshevik for support. They promised the Tsar. They promised uh, everybody because the struggle was quite tough between two emperors. So the British, they find it very justifiable 
to give all the different promises, with the exception of uh, Bill Ford Declaration. That was the promise that they tried to fulfill uh, in the region. And I think today, after 100 years, we still see uh, consequences of the uh, promises that was given uh, at that time. Uh, where are we heading today? I think this is the, an this, interesting question, yes. of course, is to look at it. Where are we heading? I think there's a four scenario in my mind that I can think of. Probably one continuous American hegemony, no competition. America remains the uh, solo superpower. There is other strong power, but not a superpower. Yes, we have uh, Russia, we have uh, China, we have India, maybe Europe, we put them together. You know, they're a strong power, but for instance, uh, people talk about the new Russia role in the region, but the whole Russia GDP is less than uh, New York City itself. So in reality, can the Russian afford to be as strong as we think, you know, and they can position themselves or they're overstretched? I think Spain GDP is also bigger than Russian uh, GDP. So if you look at that comparison, I think it makes it quite difficult to say that there is a new superpower. Yes, there is a strong power. They play a role, but they, they are not changing. China, with their $13 trillion uh, GDP, uh, also they are a strong economy, but at the same time, still their relation to the region is buyer and seller. So the first scenario will be continuous American hegemony on the uh, globe, but also which will include the, 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 I mean the region. The second is what we call uh, uh, new, new rising, which I just mentioned, the new rising of new power. And this is where the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations, his last speech in Paris, he mentioned, he said, we need multilateralism, we need other power in the world, you know, we need to have the function of that. Of course, he talked about three challenges. He talked he talk about the environment, technology and its impact as a cyber security, of course, and migration, this three issue, he talked about it as a real threat on that. The third scenario is a fragmented states. We go back to Middle Ages, so we have different, uh, uh, you know, fragmented uh, state. And the fourth scenario, which is very dangerous, and we can see it today, the rising of a violent non-state actors and their role in failing state and their contribution to failed state. And I think we have a, you know, a great example. We have Hezbollah, we have the Houthi, we have uh, uh, many examples. We have the new uh, militant group in Syria. We have in Iraq, 47 you know, militia group and so on. Post uh, uh, you know, Arab Spring or what's called Arab Spring, have we really achieved you know, what you know, people have thought and dreamed of? I think I'd like to go back a little bit of when the 2003, the US uh, were determined to invade Iraq. They invaded, they changed the government, they wrote the constitution, they enforced the constitution, did they really brought democracy to Iraq? And I think this is the big question for us on the Arab world as, as, a, as a key question, which is stability vis-a-vis -vis democracy. Is the external model ideal for us to, to apply? Maybe they had all the good intentions. Somebody who was sitting in Washington or somewhere, you know, wrote a great constitution for Iraq. But, you know, was it really applicable to Iraq? Are we seeing a stable Iraq today after, uh, since 2003 until today? Did we really achieve that? Yes, or but all this stability, what's so-called stability, uh, took us where? To what? To this, to the current situation the, yeah, in the, in I mean, the region. Yeah, but, but, but that's what I'm and saying. And after 60 years of Hafez al-Assad rules in Syria and 40 years in Egypt, yeah. and, 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 and. Yeah, but what, this is why I'm saying, you now. know, changes and reforms in the region has to come from the inside. It should be gradual. It should be with people consensus, because sometimes you cannot just apply uh, a specific model somewhere and then just imply it somewhere and say it's going to work. Not necessarily that it's going to work. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there is, yes, we all would like to have a democracy. We all would like to have a free mind connection as the conference, you know, and we, we would all love to have, uh, you know, participation. We would all love to have a gender equality. We would all love to have all this achievement. But unfortunately, the last 60 years, what you have mentioned, what did it brought? It brought extremism to the region. It brought uh, a lack of an economic you know, dependency. I mean, if it wasn't the oil uh, that came in part of the Arab world that contributed to the economic development, we would be still at the beginning of the century, 100 years ago. And uh, did we really uh, you know, 
again, uh, a protestant regime and a, a dictator regime, that's the result of it. This is what we but have. The problem, Mr. Sakhar, that we do not have the opportunity to try democracy regime. Till now, yes. never since the whole, since one century, under either colonialism or mandate yes. or the spot yeah. authorities. No disagreement in that. <laughs> you know, I, I have an agreement. Yeah, this is you. what I would like to, yes. to, to, to mention that we have never witnessed yes. a democratic regime in the region till now. To ask or to tell if this is, if can works or not. You are, you are talking about Iraq. Iraq was a failure. Yeah, well, yes, but I mean, if you look at how much the Iraqi had to pay for, uh, in, in terms of human casualty, in, in terms of destroyment, Iraq today need another hundred years to be rebuilt. I mean, my, my point was, yes, America, they wanted to bring democracy to Iraq. Have they really been able to bring it? I mean, that's a big question. Did they really achieve with all the military uh, uh, means that it has been used and all with the economic losses and the cost of the war, have they really been able to, uh, you know, to achieve that? But um, I can go back to Steve. Steve, do you think that we can think about future in the Arab world, about the reconstruction? I'm not talking about the material reconstruction, the economic re reconstruction. I'm talking about politically, culturally, education, etc. Without the ro American active role in the region, because we know the European they are, they have limited influence in the region. And now the United States is still reluctant, still, till with Trump also still reluctant to be involved in our problems. How do you foresee the future of this region if the United States will remain or keep this policy of hesitant or reluctance? Or Sam, by, by reconstruction, I'm, I'm thinking that what you have in mind is the role that the U.S. played really for a relatively brief period from the period of the Clinton administration uh, up through the, the second uh, Bush administration in which efforts to achieve political reform in the region to support the development of civil society, to try to strengthen participation, strengthen rule of law, that, that that U.S. engagement with these kinds of efforts are, are what you have in mind when you talk about U.S. support for a broader social political reconstruction in, in the region. And I have to say, I, I think um, that we can draw two conclusions from the events of the past eight to ten years. One is that the American perception is that the U.S. investment in those kinds of activities has largely failed. Uh, I think there was a moment around 2011, 2012, when there was a certain degree of optimism that the U.S. investment in support for democratic development, in support for economic liberalization, in support for uh, the strengthening of civil society had paid off, had created openings that might put the region on a different political, social, economic path. But as the post-uprising period unfolded, we saw growing disenchantment within the United States about the impact of the political openings that followed the protests during that period. And I think uh, a growing sense that, the, the U, that U.S. interests are better served by a region which is more stable, even if that stability is provided at the expense of investment in processes of political, social, uh, and, and to some extent economic reconstruction. I think the Obama administration backed away from some of the commitments of its predecessor to support for political change in the region. That trend has been deepened and accelerated uh, under the Trump administration. And so what we're seeing is a growing imbalance, a growing asymmetry in the way in which the U.S. engages in the Middle East, in which the emphasis is on relationships with regimes, military support, counterterrorism, countering violent extremism as the pillars of U.S. involvement in the region with a far greater degree of reluctance to 
complement those kinds of strategies with efforts to support civil society development, democratization. And so I, I will say, I think we're in a moment in which the U.S. can be seen, in fact, as one of the principal obstacles that reformers in the region have to contend with. And that's, that's a position that I, I do worry about personally, but I think it is, it is a, a, in the, my view at least, a more accurate reflection of where the U.S. is today. But also the, the, the lack or the weakness of this policy is it's a menu policy. It's, there is no American vision, global vision towards American policy in the region. This is the end. We are suffering by short-term hesitant policy in the region. And this is my question also to PJ, uh, about this lack of global vision. Um, well, in, in terms of, of how the United States is conceptualizing uh, you know, development these days, um, it, it used to be that, that the United States believed that, that we had all the answers in Washington and we would come in, impose solutions you know, on other countries, uh, fix things in a relatively short period of time, and then depart. Um, that model hasn't worked out very well. Um, we, we then tried a, another concept of development where there was a local plan for reform, um, and then the, you know, the United States would try to find ways to support a plan that was generated at the local level from the, from the bottom up. Th that still remains an interesting you know, idea. But then if you, if you um, expand the, the aperture, um, the importance of public investment uh, you know, in, in the West in particular, um, is, is declining, you know, in, in part because um, populations are, are questioning not only the value of foreign aid, but also the efficacy of foreign aid. And, and, and you're seeing as a development model a movement from the public sector to non-governmental organizations. Uh, that are, you know, uh, you've got the Gates Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, other foundations that are, are trying to do discrete things that make the, the lives of citizens here and there better. Um, and then you have the, uh, the importance of, of foreign direct investment. Um, you know, and, and so I, I think we're, we're trying to figure out what, you know, as we go along, what is this appropriate mix of public investment or, or, or public action that can create, you know, as Steve said, stability, and then private initiative that actually it will be the generator of innovation, jobs, education, that builds up the capacity of, of states you know, to, to, to do more. And then in, in the mix of this is the challenge of, of expectation. You know, be, behind the perceived decline of the existing order is the fact that people are losing faith in, in the ability of institutions, you know, to, to deliver meaningful services and meet their growing expectations. Um, and so that I, I think I think we you know part of what we have learned in Washington is that that the American idea that we can fix problems very quickly and very straight you know in a, in a linear fashion you know that has we, we've experienced as has taught us that's that's not going to happen. I think we're beginning to understand that that genuine transformation you know whether you're talking about an Iraq whether you're talking about uh, a Libya. Um, or you know, when you're talking about a Saudi Arabia, you know, transformation is going to take multiple generations to move from where we are to where people want us to be. Uh, just be before opening uh, the question and answer to the floor, I have to ask uh, Mr. Saar and, and Stephen about one thing, about, and also the American policy in the region. 
uh, let's talk about the sanctions against the Iranian. Uh, do you think, Stephen, is it uh, enough or efficient without putting any re uh, serious, let's say, pressure on the Iranian in Syria and Lebanon? I mean, they are focusing on the sanctions without an active, uh, clear vision and policy to the Iranian interference in Syria and Lebanon. And the American knows very well that uh, Syria and Lebanon are too important, extremely important to the Iranian. Um, the same question yeah, for Mr. But please, short, we only sure. have just five minutes and we have to open sure. the I, question I think, to the floor. I, I think, Sam, in part that the way to think about that question depends very much on what we imagine the end state is that the Trump administration is trying to achieve. Uh, if the goal is to apply enough pressure on Iran to create incentives for Iran to change it, its regional behavior, then I think we have to recognize that, in fact, sanctions are not the only element of that strategy, that the presence of U.S. forces in eastern Syria is seen as part of that strategy, that the U.S. collaboration with Israel to try to apply pressure on Russia, to persuade Russia to pressure Iran to reduce its role in, Lebanon, in Syria is part of that strategy. So it's a strategy with multiple uh, multiple pieces, yes. not just a single piece. If the end state of U.S. policy is regime change in Iran, I think the Trump administration has bitten off a great deal more than it can chew. Uh, I do not anticipate that it will be able to achieve that, that goal. Um, the impact of the sanctions themselves, I think, will be more modest than hardliners in the White House would have preferred because the waiver process will mitigate the cuts in oil production and exports that, might, that were really the central um, coercive instrument that the Trump administration hoped to bring to bear on Iran. Uh, giving, giving Turkey a waiver, for example, alone will dramatically increase the amount of oil that Iran can export. So what we're seeing is a policy that does have a number of elements, but where its implementation and its purposes remain poorly defined. Exactly. And where the resources on the ground that have been uh, deployed to advance the objective are inadequate and are not necessarily being properly used. So I think we have to recognize that what we're seeing is a policy in formation, a policy which continues to be deeply debated in a contentious way within Washington. And my own expectation is that we should anticipate that the impact of that policy will probably be quite a bit more modest uh, than the Trump administration might prefer, both with respect to economic pressure on Iran and with respect to political pressure on Iran to change its regional behavior. In two okay. minutes. Just, <laughs> two minutes. Just I think I'd minutes. like to remember yes. what uh, late Prince Saud al-Faisal, the Saudi foreign minister, said in a Manama dialogue in 2004. He said, we would love to have a safe Iraq, a friendly Iran, and a prosper Yemen. He defined, you know, he wanted to have a friendly Iran. And to have a friendly Iran, I myself have been very much involved in a track two discussion with the Iranian. And I remember one of them once he said, we were kicked out twice from the Mediterranean and we are back to it. I can see the pipeline from Abadan to Tartus. That was the Iranian message that we get from the Iranian. So they still have expansionist, interventionist, you know, policy. They are using sectarian as a dimension of an expansion, which is totally unacceptable. I think from Saudi position, I can say we don't like both. We don't like the Turkish using Muslim Brotherhood as a, a means of expansion, their spheres of influence. Neither the Iranian using the sectarian dimension as a Shia to expand the you know, spheres of influence. This is where we agree now with Trump. We agree with him that, yes, we need to revisit the... Uh, is it uh, enough what 
uh, American administration is doing well, it's not, to counter you know, Iran no, or no, not? I, this I, is my, my, I my think, question. I, I think for your specific question, no, we need to have more clarity because whatever decision will come out of Washington will have consequences and impact on our side here, which means mm. if he decides to go in confrontation, what is the rules of engagement? It's going to be in our part of the world, this you know, war. If it's going to be more economic sanction and the people in Iran will suffer more, the consequences also will be in our region. So we would like to have far more clarity, clarity. on the 12 point that was mentioned by the era, I mean by the US administration. How are they going to implement it? Is it just going to be an except? I mean, waiving eight countries, that almost 70 percent of Iran export using Turkey. Turkey will be an outstanding platform for smuggling a lot of Iranian oil also Turkey and to, a third, to a third destination. So, you know, keeping China, Japan, Korea, you know, all this, you know, friendly country, as they call it, that means they are not so sure that the other oil producing country can offset the shortage that will come out of Iran. Thank you. In respect to the the people who want to talk about it, and not more than a question or a question that is not a few minutes or a few minutes. I just want to compare between, if we're talking about the new world order, uh, the, the, at the end of the World War II, when the U.S. engaged proactively uh, in the rebuild of, uh, of Europe, mainly, uh, with Marshall plans and other uh, other uh, positive engagements in the euro, how are they in engaging in the region, especially in the Middle East, where we have bloody, endless wars, and uh, where um, are, are they engaging? Are they engaging positively, especially after after Arab Spring and other uh, other uh, revolutions? Are they showing uh, positive steps? Are they um, willing to rebuild these regions, these democracies that they uh, promised and, and uh, talked about since uh, engagement in the uh, in Iraqi war? Thank you. Uh, um, I guess Dr. Stephen, thank you. Thank you, although um, I'm sure PJ has insight on this. I, I, I think I can answer quite quite briefly, my sense is that if the U.S., both officials and public, were confident that investment in reconstruction would produce what you described as democracies in the region, the willingness to engage in support for that kind of post-conflict reconstruction would be much greater. I think the real concern at this moment, in particular with respect to Syria, is that engaging in support for reconstruction will simply produce the reimposition of an authoritarian regime oh. which the US views as the principal perpetrator of the violence that has caused such massive displacement, refugee flows, physical destruction, economic destruction. And as long as that perception uh, dominates U.S. thinking about reconstruction and engagement and investment in reconstruction in Syria, you will not see any support for those kinds of efforts from the U.S. government. In fact, there is a bill which is about to be passed, I hope, in the U.S. Congress, which would actually increase the difficulties that would need to be addressed that would impose conditions, I should say, on the Assad regime that would need to be met before funding could be uh, provided. I suspect the response to Yemen will be different when we're in a post-conflict moment. It is unclear what the response will be to Libya, but I think we see in Iraq a greater willingness on the part of the U.S. to invest in reconstruction. So these issues are viewed on a case-by-case -case basis, but as I said at the outset, if the U.S. were persuaded that investments would produce a form of governance that was more inclusive, participatory, just, fair, the, the willingness to participate would be much higher. Mr. Chairman. 
الاسم ولا مين بتوجه سؤالك دكتور ستيفن دكتور ستيفن اي ابريشيت يور انبوت سو فار يو دونت انفي اس اي دونت ثينك وي انفي اس از ويل اي دونت ام نوت شور ايفن اف وي انفي يو جيفين ذس اف يو ويل ترانزيتوري اسبيكت ذاتس جوين اون ان يونايتد ستيتس ماي كويستشن ريلي از اباوت اف يو كان هيلب اس يو اند ميسترز كرالي سينثسايز وير وي ستاند not in terms of uh, this pragmatic approach that we are in a f policy formation period, learning by doing here in the Middle East so far, uh, but in terms of uh, this major move that has been taking place, even before Mr. Trump, uh, from multilateralism into uh, du dual lateralism. Uh, and this aspect of uh, shift away from international organization that has traditionally played a major role here in this region, and uh, more in terms of this, uh, you know, U.S. is putting its weight uh, by on bilaterally on certain countries and trying to renegotiate NAFTA, renegotiate all aspects. So my question is really, is that how if you can synthesize that for us? I don't believe this pragmatic approach failing so far here in the Middle East, whether internationally or regionally or domestically or bilaterally, from the U.S. And if you can also bridge this, bridge this because you, your model is saying, well, if you can have this model state of uh, just and freedom and whatever. Please, sir. President can, please I'm, fin I'm finished. If you can bridge that in terms of the dichotomy that's present in values in the U.S. itself before it can be present here. So my question, if you can just uh, at large, if you can synthesize this major point in time that we live in here in the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me take a stab, and I, and I think I can bridge the two questions that we've had. I mean, the Marshall Plan was unique in that you had a war that ended so dramatically and with the complete defeat of its two key protagonists. Um, wars since then have not ended anywhere near as decisively, um, and if, if they end at all. I, I mean, I, I go back to what President Trump said during his visit last year to Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, and and he, he, the context was, extremism, but he basically said to Saudi Arabia and the region, you have to solve this. Um, if we look at Syria, there's, there's no shortage of multilateral effort to try to bring the various uh, protagonists to the table. Part of the challenge of Syria is its absolute complexity. You know, we think of Syria as one conflict. I think of it as five, and it may be more than that. So which dimension of this, you know, the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the rivalry between Israel and Hezbollah, um, the rivalry between the Shia and the Sunni, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which, which of those problems do you expect the United States or the international community to solve um, <laughs> for you? Um, I, I have been on the fringes of Middle East peace for 25 years. And, and that's an example of where we, we know pretty much what the answer is. What has been missing for 25 years is political will on the part of the Israelis and the part of the Palestinians or on the part of the region to make the necessary political compromises to get to the solution which is fairly well understood. And, and so I, I think that the United States institutionally continues to engage even if the president himself has stepped back, but, but this is where I think that you have to think in terms of multilateral support to regional solutions. And unfortunately for us, sometimes, um, I, I, I always draw a parallel between Syria and the Balkans. The Balkan war was waged for an extended period of time until it brought itself to a point at which it could be successfully concluded with international intervention. The tragedy of Syria is that um, everyone still believes that they can achieve their objectives through military means. As long as that is, continues to be the dominating thought process, there's going to be a limit to what the United States can do 
or the international community can do. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, I am, I am uh, General Jor Sabir. I am uh, a retired general from the Lebanese Army. Uh, my question is for Mr. Crowley and uh, Mr. Freeman. Uh, uh, what you have described for us, it is something uh, that you forgot, both of you, the core of the problems in the Middle East. It is since 1948. And this problem, it's the coming of the Jews fleeing Europe from the Holocaust and take Palestine by force. So this problem caused all the problem that now we are living and my country, Lebanon, suffered the most of this, uh, of, of, of this situation. So Mr. Trump was clear and uh, uh, personally I support him when he said, let's finish with Iran and its acolyte, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, what called in Iraq, Hashd Shabi, and Houthi. When we are finished, he said, I will propose a solution for the conflict of the Middle East. And is exactly what, if he, if he really uh, uh, will, will hold his words, this is exactly how we should start a new era in the Middle East. This is the core of the problem. So my question is, for Mr. Feynman and Mr. Crowley, is Mr. Trump willing really to do that? This is my question, and this is the beginning of all our, the ending of our unhappiness, and the beginning of a real Middle East, maybe as uh, uh, Mr. Uh, I don't know, the uh, Israeli, uh, President, describe him the new Middle East. General, let me ask a question. Let me ask a question. It's Mr. Crowley and Mr. Freeman, I said. Ah. Um. Stephen. Look, I, I, I appreciate the question. I don't share your diagnosis right. of the source of the problems in the region. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll make that clear at the outset. But. But let me answer it on a somewhat more general level. I, I think part of this transition, this transformation that the region is undergoing, concerns the conditions in the region that the U.S. thinks will provide possibilities for advancing U.S. interests in the Middle East. In the past, I would argue that U.S. administrations perceived that there was one particular constellation of conditions on the ground that would most effectively advance U.S. interests. That, that those conditions included governments that were less repressive, more inclusive, economies that were less state-centered, more market-oriented, success in achieving a settlement of major political conflicts in the region like the Israel-Palestine conflict. All of these were seen as part of a package that it was necessary to invest in in order to secure U.S. interests. I now believe that the U.S. perceives that there are any number of domestic configurations that are consistent with U.S. interests in the region, which are increasingly focused on stability, security, and a capacity to address issues of extremism and counterterrorism and that how governments in the region achieve those conditions is up to them. And that whether or not those conditions continue to require the kind of settlement of the Israel-Palestine conflict that was once completely taken for granted, a two-state solution is no longer taken for granted. So to the extent that colleagues in the region continue to look to the U.S. to advance a particular vision of what the Middle East should look like, because it has an interest in that vision, I think we may have moved past that point. I think we now may be operating on what is often described as a far more transactional basis in which the strategies and arrangements that the U.S. perceives as consistent with its interests are far broader and the responsibility for achieving them rests with local actors. I have many questions, but I, I think uh, we still have maybe uh, f last five minutes. 
the last five minutes, maybe if you give us the, your last remarks in two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. Mr. Abdel Aziz. Well, I think first we have to get out of this blaming policy. It's great always to blame the U.S., but we need to get out of that when and put our own act together. What is it? How do we envisage our future and our vision where people can contribute and emphasize in how they would like to see it? You know, maybe the role of the U.S. could be to, as a facilitator, maybe, uh, uh, you know, to help, maybe to give an incentivization, you know, maybe to uh, use the stick if they have to for those whom they are not willing to. But at the same time, things has to come from us, from the inside. We have to determine our future and not let somebody else determine our future and what we need uh, and, and, and how we would like to see our country look like. We have to determine our you know, political system, our economic system, how we would like to see it, employment, youth. We have to look at all our domestic, regional, and ex international problem, find out ourselves the solution. Why the Turk, you know, they, we call it in Arabic, Hunalika Barnamij Turki, Hunalika Ru'ya Irani from Mantika. Why can't we have our own Arabs and our own domestic ones? But he is more Arab. Hopefully, I still هذا السؤال اليوم بعد في شيء اسمه نحن أم من؟ At least we have a common language. دولة دولة. At least we have a common language that we speak it all. <laughs> but well, we're we're speaking English because we have a distinguished guest coming here. So, yeah. PJ وآخر شيء. Um, I would. I would end by saying that it, it's vitally important for the region, I think I'm stealing something that Stephen said earlier, uh, needs to operate based on a, a policy of inclusion as opposed to a policy of exclusion. There's no solution to the war in Syria or the war in Yemen without having Saudi Arabia and Iran sit at the same table. Um, back to our friend talking about you know what happened in 1948 understand that history but there were decisions made here in the region in 1969 in 1973 uh, in 2000 um, that could have made the situation better it made the situation worse uh, Egypt for example um, you know has made peace with Israel um, is is but but you know, why is Egypt where it is, where it has an educated population uh, and a failing economy? It, you know it, that's that that dynamic is not because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's because of the nature of the relationship between Egypt and its own people. That relationship has to change in some fundamental way. So what's what's the solution? Part of the solution rests here in Lebanon. Yeah, where you, you have a, an inclusive uh, system uh, you know, by constitution. It has its challenges and its weaknesses. Yeah, where else do we need to see a model emerge that others can copy? Um, you know, Tunisia, it is the only place given the uh, revolts of 2009, 2011 and so forth where you, you have political actors operating at least for the moment in an inclusive as opposed to a zero-sum manner. That, that's, you know, what hap what's happening in Tunisia, we have to find a way to bottle that and, and, and move it to other parts of the region. One minute. Uh, and I'll, One I'll, minute. Be, I'll be very brief. Sam, you asked about what the U.S. vision for the Middle East is. I, I think it's equally unclear what the Arab vision for the future of the Middle East is. We've seen an extraordinary fragmentation of ideas about what the future uh, of the Arab region should look like uh, across the Arab world. And we have also seen the absence of any kind of process, any kind of framework that would provide the space within which Arabs could themselves contribute to shaping a vision for the future of the Arab world. And it is a future which I think will have to include Iran and respond to some of Iran's concerns about its own security and interests uh, in the region. And I would hope that the frameworks needed to develop and cultivate and implement a positive vision of the Arab world within the Arab world would be taken on as one of the critical challenges for leaders in this region over the coming few years. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, PJ. Thank you, Mr. Abdelaziz. 
thanks for the foundation and thank you, Mai, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.